Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Poverty Center and our continuing series, The Future Human, a conversation series, a monthly virtual encounter to reckon whence and whither humanity. Today, Melissa Nelson will be in conversation with Dr. Alex Gomez Marin. This is the 11th conversation in this series and will orbit around indigenous ways of knowing. Melissa K. Nelson is an ecologist and indigenous scholar activist. She is the bundle holder for the Native American Academy. She is a contributor and co-editor of Traditional Ecological Knowledge, Learning from Indigenous Practices for Environmental Sustainability, published by Cambridge University Press. She is also a contributor and editor of Original Instructions, Indigenous Teachings for a Sustainable Future. She is Anishinaabe, Metis, Norwegian, and a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. Alex Gomez Marin is a Spanish physicist turned neuroscientist. His research spans from the origins of the arrow of time to the neurobiology of action perception across species, from flies and worms to mice and humans. Since 2016, he has been head of the Behavior of Organisms Laboratory at the Instituto de Neurosciences in Alajante, where he is associate professor of the Spanish Research Council. Combining computational biology and continental philosophy, his current research concentrates on consciousness in the real world. Following an hour-long, lively and spontaneous dialogue between Alex and Melissa, the session will be open to questions from the audience. I will now hand over the discussion to Alex. Thank you so much, Michael, for the introduction. It's great to have you here, Melissa. We spent time together in Paris last September, and we had many conversations amongst us and the rest of participants. And it's it's really wonderful to be able to share your knowledge with the rest of the community virtually. So I'd like to invite you to introduce yourself as you often do, and perhaps do as you did, start in a good way. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everybody. Bujun and Dinoy Maganatug, Melissa Nelson, Indigeni Kaz, Makunzi Gabawi, Kidash Nindigo, Nin Anishnabe Ikwe, Piju Dodem, Mikinakwa Juing, Turtle Mountain Chippewa, Nindunji Ba, Miu Miguich, Minobi Madaziwe. And I said greetings to you all as relatives. I greet you as relatives individually, but I also greet all the relatives that give us life today. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the tea that we're sipping, the food that we uh, enjoy that nourishes us, the land that we stand on, um, the sky above, the sun, maybe the moon for some of you if you're in the dark. And to always remember um, those that came before us, uh, our ancestors that gave us life. So this is what we often call starting in a good way. And I've seen indigenous peoples all around the world do this. Um, the great Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, the Iroquois of North America, they always start with something called the Thanksgiving Address, the words that come before all else. Before we start our agenda or our plan, we acknowledge all that gives us life and to bring our minds together as one. And so it's a beautiful way to start. And I just said what's a classic Ojibwe protocol greeting. I greeted you all as relatives, acknowledged all of the, the spirits of the land. And then I shared my English name, Melissa Nelson. I shared my Ojibwe name, uh, Makunzi Gabawik. And I shared that I'm a member of the Lynx clan and a tribal member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. So it may be confusing, we have many different names. Our cultural spiritual name is Anishinaabe, means the first people or the spontaneous people. Ojibwe is another name used for us in Canada. And then Chippewa is another name used in the United States. But we're all the same people, one of the largest tribes in North America, spanning five US states and three Canadian provinces. And we still have our language, which is something that is very, very special. So thank you for um, welcoming me here. And I'm just so happy to see you all uh, this morning where I'm at. And I am here um, on Mount Tamalpais, this beautiful mountain behind me. I am in Coast Miwok territory, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco Bay Area, California. 
and Mount Tamalpais is the West Mountain, uh, sacred mountain to the Coast Miwok Nation, uh, represented by the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria and other Coast Miwok and Ohlone peoples of this land. So I always acknowledge the first peoples whose land I am on. So thank you, Alex. So good to see you. Thank you. And already here, first comment before going into the 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 meat of the conversation, which is, and this happened to me also when we met in Paris, that to a Westerner like me, what you just did may come across as performative, but it is not, right? We're not used to it. And in the same way, and as when we did this, this, uh, this ceremony, you're watching it and, and you feel it's real, but there's something in your mind, perhaps it's the Western way of knowing, that right. says, oh, that's so cute. But this is really real. So I wanted to emphasize that and maybe have something to comment about it because we're not used to it. And, and then and then, well, how do we how do we react to what you just did if if we've never experienced it before like that? Exactly. I think that's such an important distinction. I mean, just that, you know, I didn't just greet you as individuals. You know, I greeted the land. I greeted um, the unseen. And that's something so foreign, right, in the Western mind that um, you do that quietly in prayer and church or whatever your religion may be, but you don't acknowledge the unseen that are with us right now and acknowledge the all the relatives that give us life. So um, it reminds me of a quick story. I recently went to Hawaii and was hosted by a wonderful Hawaiian knowledge holder. And we met other elders and we were with a group of funders, non-native funders, um, Euro-American folks. And when we went to the sacred place, the elder said, introduce yourself to the, the place. And, and they were like, you mean to you? And they're like, no you have to introduce yourself to the spirits that occupy this place. And it was so profound for the folks who had never done that before to introduce themselves, their, who they are, where they come from, their ancestors to the spirits of the place. And that's just, yeah, one thing that indigenous peoples do, you know, all around the world. I've been very, very honored and privileged to meet with many different folks. And it's a very common practice, but it's not common um, to the Western mind. Yeah. And yet that we have the same longing, I would say. And perhaps this is ending, this is beginning from the end, but there's something about what you did and what you just explained about what you did that has to do with everything being sacred. And maybe in other cultures or in other traditions, we're used to certain things, certain moments being sacred and all the rest, well, we could call it profane. But if you introduce yourself to a place in the way you did, then it means that, that everything from the mountain to, to the chair, to the person you have in front is, is treated as sacred, isn't it? Yes, that's right. And it's a big debate, right, in religious studies and philosophy. If you call one place sacred, then other places not sacred. Or why is one place more sacred than another? I mean, what I hear and what I um, believe or value is that all life is sacred. There's no doubt about that. But there are certain places that certain people have been worshiping, praying. There are certain power spots, if you will, many mountains, many springs, many watershed areas. People feel it all around the world, doesn't matter what your background is. You feel power from land. You feel power from places, from trees. And, you know, we, we make offerings there and we receive messages or visions or intuitive ways of knowing. And that is something that is so powerful. Um, with gardens, you know, and we humans love to make habitats. We're designers. We love to create spaces that are sacred. Um, and then we do other things in other spaces. So it's a very human thing to honor special places. But indigenous peoples have never forgotten because we have tens of thousands of history of honoring certain places over multi-generations and other cultures do, but indigenous peoples really do in North America, that, which is what I know best, yeah. So what are indigenous ways of knowing? How could you explain what, what you mean by, by those ways? Yes, I mean, it's a great new 
it's, it's an old concept, but it's a new term that's finally catching on that there are multiple ways of knowing. A more academic way of talking about it would be cognitive pluralism, right? And, and epistemic justice. There are multiple ways of knowing rooted in our languages, our worldviews, our values, our cultural lenses, our conditioning. We're all conditioned by our cultures, right? We're all conditioned by um, where we grow up, how we grow up, race, class, gender, all these layers create these certain conditions, the way we know things. And so indigenous ways of knowing are very much rooted in our indigenous knowledge systems, which are rooted in our languages. Just like you heard, that's why I like to share. I'm just a, a nascent learner of my Anishinaabemo in my language. But even one word, one way of connecting with the spirit of that language that was spoken on this land for tens of thousands of years, it really has certain potency and power. You know, we are oral cultures, <clears throat> pardon me, both oral and oral, speaking and listening. And the memory is so connected to sound and to voice and to our languages. And we talk about our languages coming from the land. They come from the rivers. They come from the mountains. Many, many stories from different tribes. And so just in the U.S. alone, we have over 500 nations, right? We have over 100 distinct languages. Uh, it, we used to have hundreds of distinct languages. Sadly, many of them are endangered or dormant. We don't call them extinct. We call them dormant because people are revitalizing so-called extinct languages through a variety of means which I think is just so incredible, the resilience of the human spirit and of human cultural expression. So we learn from the land, we learn from our stories, we learn from songs, we learn from, you know, quote, non-human nature, from plants, from animals, we learn from our clans, me being a member of the Pijou, the lynx clan, you know, a northern cat from you know, the northern boreal forest and um, the way the, the cat moves through the land, the way the cat hunts, the way the cat cares for its young. You know, then there's the bear clan and, and their medicine keepers and their warriors, their protectors of the village. Then there's the turtle clan, the elders, the wisdom keepers. Turtles live both in water and land, have a lot of wisdom. Um, they're very patient, they're slow. You can't rush a turtle, right? And so it's a different way of knowing. And so today there's a whole new science called biomimicry, right? And I work with a lot of wonderful biomimicry specialists um, at Arizona State University and around the country and the world. And biomimicry is trying to revise the way biology has been done so that rather than learning about nature, we learn from nature and with nature, and we learn how to mimic our human systems so that they're more adaptive, more resilient than um, the Western systems that we've created that are sadly, you know, really harming um, the life support systems. I recall this word concept, mashkiki, and that it had to do with the strength of the of the earth. Could you could yes. you unfold that? And also, because I think it's related. You've mentioned the land already many times, and and I think it naturally leads us leads us into not just knowledge in terms of ideas, but also medicine, arts, and law. I would like to walk all these areas. It's really yeah. pluralistic, as, as as we can all see already. Yeah. So what's that strength of the earth, Mashkiki? Beautiful. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so Mashkiki is an Ojibwe word that often translates simply as medicine. But if you actually break down the etymology of the word, um, Aki is land or territory or earth or soil, Aki. So um, Anishinaabe Aki is our Ojibwe territory. And then mash, mash is that you'll hear that word a lot, mino, mash, the strength of. So it's something that's strengthening up from the earth, much like right now it's autumn, the rains have come in the forest, we see all these mushrooms popping up, right? And you see the strength of the earth, it's invisible and then the conditions are right and the sprouts come up like in the springtime. So the earth is filled with medicines, seeds and plants and fungi and so many medicines that you know when the conditions are right, they sprout up. And so for us, our medicines, everything comes from the earth, right? Our clothing, my jewelry, these glasses, some sand, you know, the riverbeds. 
everything comes from the earth and to recognize that that is the source of our medicine. So why would we pollute and destroy the source of the very thing that gives us life and gives us medicine? And we know in philosophy and alchemy and you know, Rumi talks about that connection between poison and medicine. And I think we're really at this interesting edge right now as a global society of what is we have turned so much medicine into poison, you know, with benzene in our rivers and drinking water. How can we again flip the script and switch and, and restore our medicines and transmute poison back into medicine? I think that's such an important question for our times. And I do ecological restoration work where we literally try to do that on the land, bring back native species, clean up rivers, et cetera. So the strength of the earth is something that indigenous peoples know is our foundation. It's our baseline. Um, the great Leroy Little Bear, who is a dear friend of Pari Center, um, Blackfeet knowledge holder, he says that we, as humans or as indigenous peoples, we find our cultural resilience in the medicines of the land. We find our cultural resilience in the medicines of the land. And so that is, again, going back to, you know, the ecological relationships that give life and that create diversity and create beauty and create food and medicine and all these spectacular things. So indigenous ways of knowing are really about holding up the obligation and the responsibility to care for those medicines that give us life and not only care for them and steward them and guard them, but to augment them and create more beauty with them and that's where cultural diversity comes in that really augments and and accentuates the beauty of the earth and that's why there's such diversity of indigenous cultures dance styles regalia you know languages songs um you know performances like you said but really rituals and the way our clothing um all of that diversity whether you look at an inuit person from the arctic or an amazonian person with all the beautiful feathers or an Ojibwe person from the Great Lakes and our birch bark canoes, you know, the beauty and strength of the land, the medicines give rise to that beautiful cultural diversity and resilience. I find outstanding that such a diversity at the same time seems to rest on a on a really lovely unity. So so we we are, we've already mentioned pluralism and I want to come back to it, but at the same time, it's not a pluralism as, well, here's a little bit of this and here's a little bit of that. Like we used to say, well, interdisciplinary, because here all of those things are, <clears throat> sorry, properly internally related. So we already spoke about knowledge at the same time, same time, the earth, medicine, you just mentioned art. And I recall these examples you were, you were presenting to us, like the totem and this other one, which was some sort of, of handmade craft that instantiated, embodied a piece of art and also knowledge and also perhaps medicine and also perhaps also law and responsibility, which you already alluded to. Yes, so yes. tell us something about those really concrete objects. Pick one of, of your favorite one and, and how yeah. they not only represent, they are um, all of those things at the same time. Absolutely. Well, I mentioned the the Jiman, the Wigwas Jiman, the, the birch bark canoe that was, has been used throughout the Great Lakes of North America, the East Coast with the beautiful um, birch trees up in Canada, not so much for ocean voyaging, but for rivers and lakes um, and for fishing, obviously, and travel. And that's how my ancestors traveled, both my Ojibwe ancestors and I have French ancestors, too, from the French fur trade. And then then the Vikings from the Norwegian, that's a whole other canoe. But anyway, before automobiles, you know, we use these tribal canoes. And um, I work a lot here in California with a lot of the people who are revitalizing their tribal canoes. And so the birch bark canoe is just an extraordinary um, technology. You know, if you take the bark, um, it was also, uh, I mean, if, you haven't seen birch bark it peels off beautifully into these very thin layers and one side is waterproof it will not it's impervious to water and the other side lets in water so it's perfect for making a canoe and of course my ancestors they knew that and that they made these watertight canoes based out of this thin bark that you had to construct 
and and you had to harvest from the trees without killing the trees just like up in the pacific northwest they do a cedar um, which is another beautiful canoe tree and the cedar is also has these properties that resists water on one side and lets in water on the other side also the smell is very medicinal um, so between the birch bark canoe and the cedar canoe they embody they also embody they're like a human they have a head they have a heart they have lungs they have a tail and so we we embody them as like a sacred vessel a sacred being and um, they're named they're often named often a clan is responsible for them and so it's so important that we recognize the ecological knowledge of understanding the birch trees how they're harvested when they're harvested the elders and the canoe makers go out and listen to the forest and listen to the tree that wants to give itself for the canoe. We don't have an idea that we go, I'm, that's the biggest, best one. I'm gonna take that tree and use that for the canoe. No, we go out and meditate and spend time in the forest and find out which one wants to give its life or at least give its skin, part of its skin to be part of this canoe and be part of the sacred vessel. And then, you know, how we care for it and who gets to go in it at certain times of the season and who goes and fishes for certain kinds of, you know, um, fish for food and for medicine again. And there's all these stories connected to how we were given the canoe by um, Nana Buju, our trickster character and how we care for the canoe um, and then even when they die they're organic biodegradable then they return to the earth again so there's so much wisdom in just one object like that again here in california with the baskets the beautiful pomo baskets are renowned as some of the most complex and gorgeous in the world they have little clam shells often embedded of them they also have often have the little top knot of the quail um, california quail have this beautiful little top knot and they would put these little quail head um, knots in the top of these baskets and they're called medicine baskets that contain certain sacred materials um, and then the one example I gave from the Pacific Northwest are the beautiful totem poles that um, the Nuchanols, the Haida, pretty much from Washington State up British Columbia, Alaska all the way up um, the Pacific there um, the beautiful temperate rainforest, and they create these beautiful cedar plank homes and these gorgeous totem poles. And there's been a lot of sad, like I said, performative and stereotypes and also kind of a caricatures and, you know, derogatory, oh, low man on the totem pole. And there's all these projections on what the meaning is. And I'm not from those tribes, so I can't share hardly anything, but the little I've learned from elders is that um, that is their law. That is the way that they represent their clans, their treaties, their relationships to the eagle, to the bear, to the frog, to the salmon. And it's their, again, sacred obligations to care for those animals and plants that give them life. And so it's not the low person on the totem pole is not the lowest and the one on the top. The low is touching the earth. Again, in my culture, we would say mashkiki, touching the strength of the earth. So it is closest to the law, to what we talk about in science is natural law. Indigenous peoples talk about natural law as well as and natural law and cultural law. And they converge in these sacred objects, whether they're canoes or they are totem poles or baskets or the classic are the wampum belts of the Haudenosaunee and um, these shell beads and belts that represent sacred stories. It's also our writing system. You know, this is how we documented our oral histories and our, um, you know, epic uh, journeys across the land in these symbolic languages on um, wampum and on rock art and pictographs uh, and the designs on baskets and pottery. So we did have a language. It was a written language, just different from the script alphabet of uh, European cultures. Thank you. What, what an exuberant um, beginning of this conversation, Melissa. I want to turn into something a bit darker because human nature 
um, has its lights and its shadows. And I want to talk about conflict since maybe as a follow-up to talking about law, let me preface it by saying, well, there's also a caricature view of what you may be saying that says, well, you know, it's all so nice. We, we're always in harmony with the earth and everything is easy and also amongst ourselves. But humans um, have conflicts all the time. So I wonder how are conflicts dealt with in, in, in such cultures? And also, I recall an expression you, you, you said, rather than bashing heads, sharing breaths. And that is very resonant also with Bohemian dialogue and, and the kind of activities that we practice in Paris. So there's a natural connection there. But the question is, well, when there's a conflict, how is it resolved? And, and what can we learn from other ways of resolving conflict? Not, not to speak about war, which is conflict um, to, the, to the square power, right? Absolutely. Oh my gosh, humans are humans. Indigenous people are like everyone else and there's lots of conflict. And then we have the added dimension of having centuries of colonization. And so as colonized people, we have internalized colonization um, and historical trauma. And so, yes, there are lots of conflicts, um, you know, in, in our communities, like all communities. Uh, what we know historically is that there were different ways of resolving those conflicts um, based on uh, often consensus processes, based on checks and balances. We know that even the U.S. Constitution, um, Franklin and others really observed the Six Nations Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, how these six distinct warring tribes came together under the tree of peace. Um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, which is about building a strong alliance. And we even use some of the symbols. The, the story was that one arrow can be broken very easily, but if you put six arrows together and try to break it, you cannot break them, right? So the strength and power of unity and coming together in confederacies and alliances is something it, that North American, Native Americans really did a lot with the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, with my Anishinaabe Confederacy, that was the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Ottawa, um, the Blackfeet Confederacy. So many of the tribes learned early on, it was much better to work together with trade, through marriage, through ceremony than it was to war with each other. And so we created intertribal treaties. Um, again, the Anishinaabe came from the East Coast and went through the Iroquois territory and they were battling and they were fighting for territory. And after a long time, they decided we can't keep doing this. So they created a treaty, uh, the one dish with one spoon, the land, the whole Great Lakes and St. Lawrence seawater area is the one dish of the land that gives us food. And we all, we just have one spoon and we have to eat one bite at a time. So this, this season is your time to harvest. We won't take from that. Then you pass the spoon on to us. This is our season to harvest. So it's a very, very um, amazing system of agreements about land use and when to use resources at certain times. And then when there were direct confrontations, um, you know, there's many different systems of traditional conflict resolution, usually elders or people in the community, almost like mediators, professional mediators would try that. There were often a lot of our sacred games, um, you know, lacrosse and basketball, a, a form of that, like the Mayans. I mean, they played often for death, till death, but they also played whoever won those games, like it resolved a conflict. You had to literally bury the hatchet. You know, that expression even comes from the Haudenosaunee when the Six Nations came together under the great tree of peace that the peacemaker brought. They had to bury their hatchets under the tree of peace and say, no more war, no more fighting. Diplomacy, dialogue, um, conversation, you know, and that's what really came together and where Bohemian dialogue and indigenous ways of communicating are so um, consonant or parallel because you don't necessarily have an agenda. You don't necessarily have a leader. You have open time and you let the conversation unfurl. You let what needs to be shared be shared. You bring your minds together as one and you, you come to some kind of resolution. Even if you agree to disagree, you do that nonviolently and you do that with respect. 
And then if things get really out of hand, then you have to do reconciliation. And there's like the Lakota have a very sacred, beautiful ceremony, wiping the tears ceremony, where, you know, that's often when some family member would kill another family member, you know, and that revenge would be horrible if you just keep killing and killing, sadly, like we're seeing the world today with these wars. And so you end the violence, you have to end it. Um, and often, and traditionally, I've heard many cultures, if you know, if one of my family members killed one of your family members, you would then have to give me one of your family members, we would adopt them. And they would have to fulfill that role and that function that of the family member that was lost that died. And so that was then a way to make your enemy your family, right? Because all of a sudden, your family member, even though just killed one of ours and part of us wants to just kill back we would say no you have to give a sacrifice one of your family members not to death but they have to now come live in our village and then they're going to take become part of our family but then we have that family tie so there's wiping the tears ceremony then that would help to release that grief bury that and start again new many of our ceremonies were about renewal ending things closing things and starting new things oh closing relations and opening new relations this is really moving yes so i see at least here three elements one is education because that needs to be practiced and mastered as a skill all, all of that what you're saying it's not something that they tell you about and then you go and do it it's a skill another element that i see is some sort of a divine entities like all these spirits or however you want to call it like there's something they're helping that it's not just us and the third element and then you can go pick which one you want is is the elder the figure of the elder and we we also have elders here i would say here at least in europe but they are they've lost this sacred touch too because what's an elder an old it's not by definition an old person and at the same time elders seem to play this absolutely central role in all of what you're saying. So, well, these are three different routes. Um, I find them both, all of them fascinating. And what would you say about them? Mm, very interesting. Well, I think there's knowledge and there's wisdom, right? And um, the Western world has been so focused on gaining knowledge, technology, science, you know, exploring the genetics, going deep into the micro world um, and, and the cosmic world with astrophysics on your fields, you know, exploring the outer world. But we've kind of atrophied exploring the inner world. And um, in fact, David Bohm and Mark Edwards wrote a great chapter about that in their book, Changing Consciousness, um, Technological Ascent and Psychological Descent. <laughs> and they talk about how all of the search for the outer world uh, with gaining knowledge has really atrophied some of the wisdom traditions. And uh, we know many people still privately, you know, in the mountains and wherever um, are continuing spiritual traditions um, quietly and privately and kind of holding that down. But collectively, you know, I teach young people, you know, it's about fame and fortune and, you know, stars and social media. And, you know, it's this outward knowledge rather this inward wisdom. And that takes practice, like you said. That's why the Buddhists talk about practice, you know, and, and dialogue is a practice. I'm so happy seeing my beautiful um, friends and relatives here, Heather Parrish and, and so many others who, you know, we've been practicing this dialogue for decades together and it's still an unfolding process. So education has to be cognitive, learning the concepts, the symbols, all of that, but it has to be in the heart and it has to be embodied. And that takes, you know, a committed community like PARI, you know, even though we're virtual often and global, it's still a community of practice um, to, to think together and dive deep together. And yes, there are, el there are old people who maybe have knowledge and wisdom or maybe not. And there are young people who maybe have wisdom. So it's not necessarily age, but actually, in my tradition in Ojibwe territory, in the way I was raised, we respect 
elder people, no matter what state of mind they're in. They have lived long. They have experienced life. They have survived. Life was hard, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, life was so hard. Wars, we didn't have all these modern conveniences. So I respect elders very much. And it's sad to me as I get older, your elders start to die. And it's like, ah, and then you see young people look at you and they're like, wait a minute, what are you looking at? I'm not an elder. I'm an elder in training, as we say <laughs> in the native world. We, that's what we say in the native world. We're elders in training. Um, you know, I'm mid 50s. So I'm right between like my elders in their 80s and then like 20s and 30s. So it's an interesting time to be an elder in training um, and then to remember to gain wisdom. And so getting people to me out on the land and in circles, we call them talking circles, dialogue circles, any circles. There's lots of new technologies in the organizational development world of different circles. Anytime we put down our technology, sit eye to eye, heart to heart, face to face, breath to breath, and share meaning and share space What's and, and, and be vulnerable enough to share what we value, what we're concerned with, what we're excited about. And that kind of bonding is so, so critical to respecting the wisdom of elders, also to listening, to slow down enough to listen to the wisdom of the elders and their stories. So I'm, I'm all for elders. <laughs> <laughs> What do what do elders say about the future? You know, here we we attempt to explore the future human, and I've also read from you and heard from you that you speak about these seven generations back. What do the elders say about perhaps the seven generations to come? Well, again, I can't speak for all elders. Everybody's different. Some are very um, optimistic, and some, most, I would say, are not optimistic. In fact, one of my most revered elders, um, uh, Oren Lyons, Onondaga faith keeper um, of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, um, he's in his mid 90s now or early 90s. And I've been um, kind of a student of his for decades. And um, he is very, very concerned. I just spent time with him and yeah, um, he is very concerned. A lot of elders are very concerned. When you look at things like genetic engineering and you look at artificial intelligence and you look at, you know, um, going to the, you know, moon and mining Mars and other planets and all these other kind of stuff, um, it's looking pretty bad. You look at species extinction, you look at the level of pollution of our fundamental air, water, food, loss of topsoil for agricultural lands. It's looking pretty harsh. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's looking not good. And so a lot of the elders are saying, grow your seeds, get your food and medicine together, get your bundles together, as we call them, um, get your community together and hunker down because it's going to be a wild ride the next 20 to 50 years. Yeah. And, and that's what the, a lot of elders are saying. Yeah. Prepare. I mean, many different tribal words, even for the tribe means those who get prepared or those who prepare, because you never know what's going to happen. You know, it's part of the trickster in our stories, you know, unpredictability is change is so erratic, especially these days that you have to prepare. And Mother Earth has been giving us signs for a long time. Native elders have been warning about this time for 100 years, easily. You could say 500 years, honestly, from when the first colonists came to this land and started cutting down the sacred oak trees and damming the rivers and killing all the bison. You know, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't going to go, this isn't going to go in a good way. Um, you know, there's a quote um, by it's kind of controversial whether it was truly from chief seattle or not but it's a good quote you know humans will eventually drown in their own waste um and this was you know shared a couple hundred years ago by the way people were treating the earth and now it's only gotten much worse so many are very um concerned 
Um, and, and then many still have great faith in the youth and in ingenuity and the creativity of young people, which I do too, and um, embracing technology, the genie's out of the bottle, we can't put it back in. How do we actually embrace it and, and put ethical guardrails up for it and, you know, laws that kind of protect the vulnerable and protect certain things, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's pretty dire, even though I'm in the College of Global Futures, right? That is all about how do we create global futures that are regenerative um, and rooted in local community values and um, yeah, that are sustainable over time. That's really the big question. And we're looking at many different techniques from indigenous knowledges, from Western sciences, from other traditional cultures, and to me, it really goes back to, you know, how we treat each other and how we treat our earth and, um, yeah, how we're able to not know and acknowledge when we make mistakes and learn from those mistakes really well so we don't repeat them. I think that's been one of the worst things I see with the Eurocentric paradigm of success and domination and, you know, attempting anything, no matter what, um, leaving no stone unturned just to explore. And then, oops, we made a mistake. Oh, well, hide the mistake. We know that happens in scientific research all the time and then move on and not learn from those mistakes. So we just keep repeating them. And, you know, that's what many of the spiritual teachers say too, like, what's going on here? Why do humans keep repeating these dire mistakes. So uh, I'm really concerned with that and, and try as best as I can to learn from my own mistakes and, and those of others and to regenerate positive systems of care. I realize in the way I phrase the question and how you answer it, that lies part of, of the answer, because I ask you about what do elders say, again, with this kind of universality inherited from from the way we practice science since Galileo, right? But at the same time, the way you answer was, well, this elder says this thing, this other elder says that other thing, and it's by perhaps combining all these views that we can move forward. Now, in somewhere between a uh, hope, hopelessness and helplessness and an anxiety and total pessimism, and not nor going to the other extreme, which is like, this is the seven seven point bullet plan to save the planet, but some, something that perhaps trans transcends these two extremes. And it has to do, yes, as you're saying, with all these words that start with re, right? Regeneration, and you are speaking about restoration and, and recovery and rediscovery of, of all of those things that have always been there, but we've forgotten. That's right. That's right. And yet we can't go back. We can only move forward, right? We can only move forward. And yet what are those principles and values and practices? I think people misinterpret indigenous people thinking we want to go back to some other life. And we can't. We're mixed. We're modern. We're urban. We're scientists. You know, we, we can't go back, but we want to restore the values and the practices and the ways of caring for each other and the ways of caring for creation. And, and, you know, regenerating life so that our grandchildren's grandchildren will have clean water, you know, just that people can't drink clean water anymore. And the air is so polluted and the health is, you know, cancers and so many different issues of environmental injustices um, that really need to be addressed. So um, that that's something we can do. And, you know, when you feel hopeless, you do something, you know, you roll up your sleeves and you do something in your local community, in your own home, in your own being, in your family, you know, in your neighborhood, in your local watershed, in a community garden. You know, that's what gives me hope and resilience is when, you know, you just see people doing good work together. So I do a lot of work with nonprofits, the Cultural Conservancy. I was a founding executive director of that for 30 years, and I've kind of succeeded and younger folks are taking it over, but I'm still very involved and we grow native foods and we share native foods with hungry communities. And that's just one simple way, but a very special way that we can um, honor our heritage as, you know, 
native farmers and people who committed to sacred seeds and um, diverse food systems and then grow them and, and share them with communities who don't have access to them. Let me go back to the word to the word indigenous and, and also confess kind of my 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 stages with this with this word because first of all I would say I've forgotten it or we've forgotten it. Then when we hear about it from you, for example, first there's a sense of skepticism because we need to get rid of all of those um caricatures and, and misrepresentations. Maybe a third stage is a sense of wonder. Wow, what an exotic thing. Then perhaps the Western mind says, well, then then I wanna I wanna be indigenous like them. And well, what should I do? Should I perhaps copy some of those? And and but then no, exactly. And if we stay there, I would say we 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 just didn't get it. And then perhaps there's another stage which which is risk realizing that the word indigenous means well from that place, and we all come from a place with a, with ancestors and also local habits and and so could you could you perhaps reflect on that like what's indigenous for those of us who think we are not but we are but just we're indigenous precisely from the place where we are and perhaps that's the way we could practice our own indigeneity if that word exists yeah it does exist well that's that's the big question beautiful framing of that alex um you know who is indigenous and who isn't is a really complex cultural, historical, legal, political, spiritual question. Too, too much to unpack in five or 10 minutes, but thank you for framing it really well, how people react to it often, um, either exotifying it and like uh, admiring it, the noble savage, or usually the opposite, the ignoble savage, the savage, stupid, dumb, the caricatures, the Hollywood movies and one extreme or the other and not just seeing humans as humans with a different cultural system. Every human has a cultural system, has a language, has ancestors. Indigenous peoples are no different than that. What's unique is we have a specific framework for this relationality with our lands and our ancestors and our places. And that is a different worldview. And that's, you know, people can find out about more of that at the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Global Indigenous People worked for 35 years creating this document that really talks about what Indigenous means globally and what it means in terms of our clans or economies we have economic systems they're just not capitalistic economic systems the way it's practiced now even though many modern tribes had had to get pushed into modern capitalism and are doing it as well as anyone else you know so people are people um but in terms of um take me back you there was one thread well, well, I, I, okay. I was thinking about my own experience but, but, when, when you discover that that trying to copy, in my case, trying to copy Melissa's indigenous no, 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 um, no, style, no, no. it's it's a betrayal no, of the whole Catalan, message. You're Catalan, you're Catalan. Even yes. the great Dakota radical founders of the American Indian movement, John Trudell, who became a kind of mystic poet in his later years, read his work. He always said, everyone is indigenous to Mother Earth. Everyone is indigenous mm -hmm. to Mother Earth no matter what bloodline you come from. You all came from tribes. We all came from tribes. Uh, and, you know, I've done some work with some great folks from California Institute of Integral Studies who were really looking at what does it mean to be indigenous from Europe? And real, Ralph Metzner wrote a book, The Well of Remembrance, and going back to even the pre-Germanic roots of um, you know indigeneity in Europe. I mean, look what happened. You know, they with the, they burn their quote witches, women who are close to the earth. I mean, that's where that patriarchal colonial toxicity came from. But there's so many indigenous peoples in Europe, the Gaelic, that all over in the Scandinavia, the Sami. I mean, all over there were tribes, and so you don't have to go that far back to see that we all come from tribal roots. And many indigenous elders always say that. Um, the Navajo say we're from the five-fingered five clan, right? We're we are all humans. We all have these, little, these hands, these opposable thumbs. So do raccoons, but we're not gonna claim them. But anyway, we all have, you know, we're all humans on mother earth. 
And so I think it's important that everyone tries to reclaim a sense of their own indigeneity, um, whatever that means to them, and do not imitate, do not try to copy, and try to be a good ally to the indigenous peoples who still identify as indigenous, who never broke that chain despite genocidal attempts, who never broke that chain like the Sami in Scandinavia, um, or maybe the Basque in your territory, um, and so many tribes in Africa, so many tribes here in Turtle Island, North America, um, that you can become a good ally to, a relative to, an advocate, or we say an accomplice, you know, and honor the first peoples of the land who never broke that connection, despite so many attempts at breaking it. And um, I think that that's the best way to do it and, and embrace your own identity, whatever it is, German, Irish, you know, Celtic, you name it, be, be you, you be you. The, you know, the last thing that we need are, are more pretend Indians and people trying to adopt and, and, you know, assimilate and, you know, colonize again. So many things have been taken from indigenous people, the lands, the water, the identity, the spirituality, the languages. Um, you know, it's so important today in this era of racial reckoning of justice to be yourself and stand on your own ground in your own ancestral lands. And then from there, come out and, and be a good relative and, and be a good neighbor and be a good, you know, citizen of, of Mother Earth. Yes, this, this ends up being an exercise of perhaps healing our sense of orphanhood. Mm -hmm. and this seems to be what we're talking about. And, and again, your stories uh, about how for a clan, perhaps that river is sacred, but then for the neighboring clan, which is not not just epistemically pluralist, but maybe ontologically pluralist, but at the same time, they can, yes. yes, they can co-inhabit. And yet for them, that land you know, that mountain is, is sacred and for the other is the river. And there's no, that's what's wonderful. There's no conflict. There's it's no not conflict. like, yes. We're happy the upriver people are taking care of their sacred center of the universe upriver because we're yes. got our hands full downriver. And even though what happens upriver comes downriver, and so we have annual ceremonies like the Yurok and the Koruk up in Northern California. That's what their name means, upriver people and downriver people. And they have annual world renewal ceremonies to come together. And hey, the salmon were good this year. You get the first catch. Next year, we get the next catch. But that's your sacred center of the universe. And this is our sacred center of the universe. And there's no conflict. In fact, it's like a very positive thing because you're taking care of that place. We're taking care of this place. We know that the pulse, the health of that land will be vibrant. And it's not like, oh, no, my holy land. I've got a you know monopoly on that. It's actually all land is holy where you make it holy and take care of it. Yes, I think Einstein would be happy. Einstein would be happy with such a theory of relativity, and I, I don't mean it just flippantly. I think there's something quite deep about how to how to conceive that we can all have our own center of the universe, and that doesn't invalidate that other people That's have right. their own. Yes, That's right, exactly. Well, time flew, but I have one last common question for you because in in the way you're introduced, sometimes you you present yourself as as what you are as an activist scholar. And I consider myself a, well, an academic, a scholar, but lately I'm discovering that perhaps I'm also an activist, but I thought these were like water and, and oil, that they wouldn't mix together. So, so how does one become an activist slash scholar? Oh boy. Um, I think, I, th I think, I think therefore I am. I like <laughs> think. And that's my scholar. That's the scholar. Class. Yes, that's the scholar. In I you, love I think. to think. Yeah. <laughs> I love to read. I love to write. I love to ponder. I love to use the little the, my gray matter here. It's so good. But then you've got to test your ideas, right? You have to test them. Are they relevant? Are they useful? I come from very humble means. You know, I came from poor mixed race family, native and Norwegian farmers, and. You know, I, I need to be able to speak to my origins. So I feel like always translating 
academic language into common speech that I can talk to anyone about. You know, we use the word cognitive pluralism, but multiple ways of knowing. Duh, everyone has multiple ways of knowing. So I really value um, doing things in the world. And that's the activist part. You do things in the world. They may not all be good, but you listen to community, the grassroots communities where you live and what are the, who maybe haven't had access to higher education, haven't had access to museums or access to libraries or certain things like many of my tribal relatives on the reservation. And so how do you um, translate and activate? Maybe they want a community heritage center or library. Let's do that. Let's get books donated or let's get whatever it is. So the activist part is doing things in community. And you don't just come down like a lot of academics do parachute in. I, I'm the expert with all the answers here. Let me show you how to make a resilient community. You go and you make relations and you have relations and you listen, you sit in circle and do a lot of listening. And then what is needed will emerge and then how I can help with that will become more clear. Tools, technology, funding, um, partnerships, whatever, space, foods, seeds, whatever it may be. So that's the activist part. And I, I've tried doing academia 100% and I kind of get a little bored, honestly, because even though I love all the ideas, it doesn't feel as grounded. And then I've tried doing just nonprofit work 100% in the community work. And that is really exciting and really great, but I need time to reflect and step back and go, wait a minute, is, you know, is this the right action? Because sometimes it's reactive too, right? And activism does get sometimes a bad rap for being reactionary. That's the last thing I want to be is reactionary, right? I want to be very thoughtful about the actions that are taken. So that is how I combine kind of the head and the heart, the the brain and the the hands, and you know, academic work and community work. One keeps Wonderful. me very humble and very rooted and grounded. Yeah, and then I feel like I can speak truth to power more when I'm in the ivory tower with you know major scholars and really having a reality a check of what's going on in certain communities. Yes, I resonate. You should see the theoretical physicist in me changing a light, a light bulb at home uh, and how humbling that, that, can, that can be. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. It, it's very re revitalizing to, to listen to what you say. And we're, we're really honored you, you accepted to, oh, to be with us I, tonight. I love the Pari Center, you know, and, and the legacy of F. David Pede and the work with David Bohm and the work with Leroy Little Bear and so many of my teachers, Tobasana Kwak Kanu, and um, the early dialogues to look at indigenous worldviews and cosmologies and knowledge systems with quantum physics and the role of dialogue and talking circles and this kind of human technology of going back to fundamental basics and, you know, sharing our consciousness and sharing meaning together. It's just so beautiful and so meaningful to me. It's really been part of my whole life and my own healing. Wonderful. So let's open it up for the great. for our audience. Back to you, Michael. Yes, uh, great. Uh, if we're going to move on to the question and answer, kind of the open dialogue section, uh, once again, getting back to the roots. So. If you have questions, uh, could you, you use the raise your hand function? And we already have some people jumping in. And please, we have about a half an hour for questions. So if you can do like one question, and yes, I see Hugh with his hand raised. And so either raise your hand, raise your hand, or use the raise your hand function. I'm gonna call on Lloyd and then I'll call on Hugh. So Lloyd, if you'd like to jump in, um, there we go. Thank you, Melissa and Alex. This has just been a wonderful time uh, hearing what the two of you have to share with us. Uh, Melissa, I'd like to ask you to say a little bit more about law. Um, and that what came to mind is uh, Rupert Ross wrote some wonderful books. He was a Canadian uh, Crown attorney, and he was at a criminal justice uh, forum. And during a break, a young Indian leader came up to him and said, I don't understand you Westerners that all your laws 
are listing the things that you do not want to happen. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I was charged once with teaching um, American Indian law. That was so tough because um, there's more laws about American Indians in the U.S. than any other people, as you can imagine. And they're, again, all laws not what to do. And when you have to create a U.S. law about something, I believe it's almost a, a breakdown in ethics, ethical systems, right? Because don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's basically very punitive the way that law is is created in, you know, the Western world. And I'm just a student of indigenous law and particularly Anishinaabe law. John Burroughs is a brilliant Ojibwe law professor in Canada, University of Victoria. And I've been learning from him and his work. And and Sakej Henderson, a Chickasaw law professor emeritus now, um, who has been one of my mentors. And they write about law in a very different way. And indigenous law is... It, it's deeply tied, even calling it ethics, I think is not right because we immediately go to Western ethics and debates over what's morally right and morally wrong. It, it's very much behavioral. It's more about what you do. It's how you act. It's your speech. It's almost like I compare it to some people, you know, like Buddhists virtues, right? It's something that you have to live um, and embody and practice. Law is not something just written in a book you look at once in a while. Um, we even have this concept, Enrique Samona, Tarahumara ethnobiologist, dear friend, um, he writes about moral landscapes. And um, it, when you go out into your lands, this mountain, for example, here, you there's stories, traditional narratives about things that happen on the mountain, good things that happen, maybe some bad things that happen that remind us to behave well. And so when native people go out into the land, into our traditional territories, oh, that rock about that story, you know, oh, that when Sky Woman fell on Turtle's back, oh, when Trickster, you know, ate all the ducks and there were no food. Like we have these stories that remind us how to be a good human. And so these we live in moral landscapes and because the land was like our text for oral cultures, right? And the symbolic language I mentioned with canoes and wampum and baskets. So law is deeply tied to natural law, what physics calls natural law, you know, certainly gravity and all these things, ecological processes, the water cycle, you know, all of these natural laws and natural cycles we need to harmonize with those, not work against them. When we work against them, we are going against natural law. When we harmonize with them, we are enacting law. And so law is about how we act, how we behave. And um, it, it's also connected to our, deeply connected to our sacred stories and our values. Yeah, so that that's just a real short cursory understanding, but look at, um, I can give you those references, James Henderson, um, John Burroughs. There's there's a lot of great scholars, indigenous scholars from also um, New Zealand and Australia talking about indigenous law. It's a newer area for me, but when I go into science, law is right there. When I go into culture and art, law is right there for indigenous people. Like you said, Alex, how we started, they're deeply entwined. And it's not that there are three separate things coming together. There's a endogenous value and practice and system that then is scientific, artistic, and, you know, legal, if you will. It, it determines what we do and how we do it well and what's right and wrong. I mean, it really gets down to that. We can be life affirming or life destroying. <laughs> what's life affirming, right? That That's natural law. Thank you that's for great. the question. I hope that helped a little bit and check out those other uh, references. Thanks so much, Lloyd. And thanks so much, Melissa. Uh, I'd like to move on to Hugh and I'm gonna unspotlight and add Hugh in. Hugh, if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. Okay. Um, so we're gonna add spot. There you go. 
Uh, thank you, Michael. I, I, uh, first of all, I want to just celebrate the energy and the passion that both of you bring to this conversation. Uh, it, the dispassionate, being dispassionate became a characteristic of some forms of dialogue which got attached to the name Bohm. <laughs> so we had this Bohmian dialogue where one person w was allowed to speak at one time. They had to sit in a circle as a rule. Uh, and uh, to follow the rule, if, if you interrupted, that was frowned upon. And there was no passion. It was a dispassionate experience, very common. And it got associated with David Bohm through a paper by Solal Bohm, his wife, who, who was very clear in her instruction that Bohmian dialogue uh, has no purpose. And I've, I've fought against that emotionally ever since I was introduced to the notion that true dialogue has no purpose. And I know that David Bohm was passionate about the state of the planet. He spoke with a purpose to do something about the state of the planet, and yet no purpose is associated with the name Bohm. And I, it, it, the thing that it, I, I'm working now in, a, in, a, in three groups, each of them are, are dialogue practitioners involved, the Forum for the Future is one of them, bringing people together, collaboration, dialogue underpinning the collaboration, action in the service of transforming the present situation. And yet, Bowman dialogue apparently can't touch on those subjects because it is uh, uh, attempting uh, to a, a purpose, an activist. An activist. Yeah. An activist. So, yes. so oh, Melissa. Oh, that's activist. Yes. Yeah, right. So, and I love it when you break in, and then I, I'm inclined to break in. There's a kind of flurry of excitement, and I, I should uh, give way to other people who would like to say whatever they had in mind, but I want to celebrate, do not imitate. I, th I think there, are there, there seem to be two states in the United States. The United States, which was essentially derived from Europe, uh, and, and the, uh, the, 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 the United States that you represent. Uh, and and uh, the, the imitators have uh, got hold of talking sticks and circles and all of that, and it's an imitative form, uh, and actually has no roots. It 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 it, it has, does no. Now, I, I'm really trying trialing these words because I'm about to write about them. Uh, most of us never dare because it goes against the rules that were laid down by Solal Bohm. But I think it's time to challenge it uh, because there's something much more urgent calling on our dedication and passion right across the planet at every level. So thank you with thank great you, you appreciation. Know, I can't wait to see what you great. write. Yeah, please, please. Thanks stay. so much, you. Um, and we're going to jump on, um, continue. Uh, Veronica, would you like to jump in? You have your, you've had your hand raised for a bit and I'm gonna add spotlight to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's a quick question, a little trivial, Melissa. Is there a practice of vegetarianism in any of the uh, any part of the history? Wow, that's a that's a big big question. Um, I mean, again, the regional and local diversities are so great. Actually, mm -hmm. two of my students just did are doing a great research paper on it. One is a Nupiak from northern Alaska, where they eat ninety nine percent meat because they're in the Arctic. That's right. all they have: whales and seals, and you know, mm -hmm. caribou. And then another is from uh, Colombia in the Amazon part of Colombia and North South America, where they eat like, you know, 99% plants. And, um, you know, that regional difference is so de dependent on your landscape, your ecosystem mm. and your climate. Um, but certainly there's, you know, native people who adopt vegetarian, although it's rare. Um, I, I was a staunch vegetarian for many years and always got laughed at and joked about. <laughs> they call a vegetarian native person a bad hunter. Oh. Uh, <laughs> lots of jokes. 
<laughs> but my my dear colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Lois Helen Frank and um, Chef Walter Whitewater, Danae and Kiowa chefs, they just wrote a great book. Um, and they are all supporting a plant-based diet mm. for Native people because of the health implications. And actually, the more research you go into, many agricultural peoples, like in the Southwest, the Pueblos, even the Haudenosaunee, the farming people, certainly in Mexico and Central and South America, really ate majority plant-based. And that meat was on occasion. It wasn't like, ah, you know, like these right. again, caricatures of cavemen eating meat all the time um it was yeah. supplemental um, but it depended on what the land gave yeah. yeah but i would not say that the indigeneity and vegetarianism are not really uh a thing yeah yeah not really a thing because we eat our kin we eat animals like sacred buffalo or oh cow. yes Right. And, you know, and elk and deer and salmon, the salmon people. And so, you know, yeah, not many, but individuals adopt vegetarianism. I know many Native people who are vegetarians. So today, but I don't think historically it was a moral okay. decision. Yeah. Thank That's you. Question. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Veronica. And next we have Lena in the queue. Lena, if you'd like to jump in. Although, did Lena just disappear? All right. I'm here. You're here? Excellent. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. This uh, webinar for me has been very transformative, and I'll explain to you. I'll try to be concise, which I'm not so good at. Um, I'm French Canadian. I'm from Quebec City. And so technically, we were colonized by the English, but we colonized the Amir Indians. So... Uh, and we have reserves here, and um, I must admit, and I'm not going to be very popular, but then again, I'll repair whatever I'm saying. Um, the cause of the Canada has been trying to repair this colonization forever, which is not working. So I've always been a bit ticked off about how the Americans are treated here, especially in my area. So there are reserves and bad things are happening and stuff. And I have a lot of European friends that are in love with Amerindians. And so just like Alex, they want to do what they're doing or whatever. And um, I have friends that are Amerindians also, but it's always like, it's always been this subject, right? But uh, I always felt bad about feeling that way because, because, um, Human beings are human beings and stuff. And your presentation has totally changed my position. I'm sorry. I don't... <laughs> well, I guess I'm happy to feel that way now <laughs> because I've been looking forward to this. And you, you, I think you really represent what Europeans think of Amerindians, this wisdom. It has touched my heart. And um, the fact that you say that don't try to imitate, it's as if it was like, because Canadians, well, especially in my part, of the, I don't know the rest of the country, but my part, been like we've been feeling that guilt. And so we always feel like we are wrong in a way, but we don't. And the fact that you say, you know, what you were saying is this honoring everybody, this and and we're all uh, aboriginals because we all have roots somewhere and i don't know if it's the fact that we were uprooted because like french can we we come from france but we're french but we're not like you know like where are we in a way it's it's a bit like i don't know but, but a lot of people like the american like even the the united states is the same thing for the english that came but I don't know. I just wanted to thank you so much for this presentation. It has touched me a lot, and I'm so happy now <laughs> that I have this other version that that speaks to my heart truly. And uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad it was it was meaningful for you. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much, Lena. Uh, Next, I would like to bring in James, uh, if you would jump in. And... 
I will. Thanks. I have a spot with it. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Can you all? Okay, great. Uh, hold first of all to uh, all my friends here at the Harvey Center. Uh, your connection is kind of breaking uh, up right, right now. So I'm a Canadian as well. Uh oh. Okay. Is this any better? Yes. I'm gonna little, I'm gonna defer. A little bit better. You car carry on, folks. If my connection is not good, then please carry on. I was gonna just share an insight. Uh, are you as able you know, to hear me now? As it yeah, happens, it doesn't it doesn't break when you're when you're not sharing That's the insight. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Give me a second. I'm just trying to get my audio here. Maybe this is better. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. We yes. Can hear you. Yes. Much better now. Legible. All right. So first of all, it's greetings to all my friends here at the Pari Center, uh, and uh, Oki from Southwest oh. Alberta. I'm another Oki. Canadian traveling across the landscape of uh, Southern Alberta, and I wanted to share a little anecdote from my earliest history here living in the very southwest corner of the province. I was introduced to one of the indigenous elders with the uh, Bikani uh, First Nation, Dr. Reg Kroshu. Mm. And, uh, okay, that's, I heard some recognition there. Yes, um, yeah, wonderful elder. So I got to sit with Reg for two hours and I basically asked him to help me understand the essential difference between indigenous uh, values and worldview and the Western indigenous worldview that I grew up in, uh, non-indigenous worldview. Um, and he boiled it down very, very concisely for me. He said, uh, you've developed a culture based on rights of the individual in the Western world. And here in Canada, we have a charter of rights and freedoms that enshrines them. And he said, we have no concept of that. Uh, what we had were responsibilities and you earned privileges on the basis of fulfilling responsibilities to the community, to your tribe. And if you were really effective in doing that, in helping the community, being of value to the community, then you were valued by way of uh, membership in various societies within the community. And that could be the Brave Dog Society, of, for instance. But what really came on to me was, you know, the distinction between a culture based on rights and a culture based on responsibilities. And I really like to, to focus on the responsibility side of things. I think that's the essential context that can lead us to reconciliation here in Canada potentially beyond um, is, you know, who should be responsible for what and why. And to have a mature and productive discourse around, well, what really are we responsible for? Just set aside the rights for a minute. They're not gonna go away. They're a fabrication, okay? It's not something that appears in the natural world, rights. Uh, but what got humanity as far as it did as a social species is responsibility. It's the responsibility of the individual to their community, perhaps to broader society, that accounts for the sustainability of communities and societies economically. And to illustrate his point, Reg asked me to pull out my driver's license. And I said, well, what is that? I said, well, that's, that's a license. He said, yeah, but what, what does it do? He said, well, it entitles me by my society to operate a motor vehicle as I'm doing right now on public roads. And he said, well, what do you have to do to earn that license, that right, basically? I said, well, I had to pass a, a pretty simple written test and then I had to take an actual practical driver's test, which wasn't really that hard either. I said, well, that's pretty straightforward, but look at the power that it provides you with, that you now have this right to operate heavy equipment. Uh, James. James, can I interrupt for a second? Do yeah, you have go ahead. do you have go a ahead. do you have a question? Because we're on the twenty one. I would right very now. much like for Melissa to okay, there uh, we go. Thank you. share her perspective on 
the distinction between rights versus responsibilities and the potential for that as a discourse for uh, basically healing going forward. So yeah. sorry to take so long, but there's there's my question. Great. Excellent. Thanks so much, James. Yeah, thank you, James. I mean, it's a question, but it's also, you know, a comment, a statement, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I was quoting Oren Lyons earlier, and he says exact same things. All the elders say that. And I would add um, the U.S. law and U.S. society is based on individual rights, the rights of an individual. And Indigenous law is on collective responsibilities, both individual and collective, but we must be responsible to each other collectively and to our lands. So I couldn't agree more. We also often talk about obligations and not in a like, oh, I'm obligated in some sad, you know, punitive way, but actually like it feels good, right? When you're a good father, you're a good brother, you're a good sister, you're a good friend, right? It's 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 a social obligation that is a sacred obligation of being a good relative. And um, that is also that collective responsibility um, that has to be transformed. Yeah, that's why there's a lot of debate over the whole rights of nature movement that um, I've been kind of doing some research on. I find great hope in it and excitement, the way the Maori protected their Whanganui River in New Zealand, Aotearoa, with the legal rights of the river, legal personhood. But it's also based on kind of this individual idea, not collective, and it's not about responsibility. So I couldn't agree more. It's something elders share all the time about a big distinction that we need to transform. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to move through the queue. We're got, we have room for a few more people. Erica, you've been waiting for a while. Would you like to jump in, please? Yes, I would love to. Thank you so much for this. This has been wonderful. Um, I have. So I'm actually in Arizona. I just recently moved a couple of years ago to Guadalupe. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I saw ASU. I'm like, I meant to be here. And then I just was loving what you're saying. And I've been, um, yeah, I come, I'm actually in the parking lot and I've got on my car. I'm on yeah, South so Mountain beautiful. right now. Look at the beautiful Are you in yeah. territory. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, this feels like really a confirmation to be here and sharing space. And I don't know, I hope our paths can cross. Yeah, and I wanted to actually ask you. Yeah. Yes. And I would love to know, um, just since we're in, the same local space if you have any because I feel like I'm so new I feel like I'm like if you were to take a native plant and put it in a pot and put it in a shopping mall or something that's how I feel and I'm realizing oh like because I'm Chicana and I'm like but there's just don't so, you know the colonization and the shame and the and it, yeah so I guess I have two questions like I don't even know how to put words to my experience I have I feel very like cut off from even who I am and then within my family and all the trauma and and like erasure and just even shame about speaking to our own indigenous um, ancestry. And so I guess so two questions for you is one, do you have anywhere you can point me to like indigenous um activists or voices or scholars or who can help put words on my experience as someone who you know it's like I'm I'm of this continent but I can't tell you what my not even that long ago generally right my grandparents are like I, oh yes my grandmother was indigenous they don't know what tribe they don't talk about that I know yes yeah. and I, then secondly if you have any like local activism you know that I can get involved in and I know I'm right here in Guadalupe I'm a I mom know. of two young kids so I'm like I'm like I'm right here you know so um yes. but just so many barriers and mental health and all that so oh I hear you Erica thank you so much for for sharing so vulnerably and, and just courageously about your experience and I work with a lot of Chicana Latinx students who just like you, you know you're indigenous and don't have that that historical memory or that family lineage and, and all of the 
I hate to say it, but Catholic, my family from the French side were colonized by the Catholicism and to forget all of that, that cultural amnesia is so painful. So I just want to say I really hear that and, and see you with that. And um, we do have resources at ASU. And one of my, my great top students, she identifies as Latinx and Indigenous. Um, and she is a great leader involved with a lot of activist movements in the Phoenix area in the Salt River Valley. So I can connect you. You can get my email from the PARI Center or ASU, College of Global Futures. Um, I'm easy to find. And um, there's a great book called Bad Indians you should read um, by Deborah Miranda. It's a tribal memoir and she uh, grew up Chicano. She didn't find out she was native till later. It's an intense book about Spanish colonization, which is your experience in Spanish colonization of Mexico and California in the Southwest. And it's, it's won many awards. Everyone I recommend it to, Bad Indians. It's intense and it's beautiful, it's brilliant. I think it won the National Book Award or some major award. Deborah Miranda, and um, that will really help you. She has a poem about when a lie is not a lie, about identity and growing up Spanish or Mexican and not knowing your native heritage. It's so powerful. I wish I had time to even read it now, but check it out. Um, so those are a couple of resources. And um, stay strong and um, stay, stay connected to your family. And look me up at ASU. I'll be reaching cool. out. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. Nelson. It means the world. Thank you, Erica. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, we are at the 28 now. <clears throat> Alex and Melissa, <clears throat> and my voice is going even though I haven't been speaking. Do you have anything else <clears throat> that you'd like to wrap up with? Uh, some final comments before we do our announcements at the very end. Alex, any? any... I, I feel this, this has been very real. That's the only thing I would say. Today, it has been very real. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to express gratitude to you, Alex, for inviting me for this conversation. We didn't get to future scientists, but, but we know this is an ongoing conversation. I want to thank all of you for being here today with us. I'm really grateful for your time and your attention. and sharing this space and um, your great questions and comments. I can't wait to read the chats. Uh, I want to thank Eleanor and the Pari Center community um, for hosting these dialogues. And there are a lot of resources out there um, to learn more about this. I mentioned the Cultural Conservancy at nativeland.org, um, my work at Arizona State University and in the Indigenous um, Knowledge a focal area I lead. We have workshops and events and things. Um, there's a lot of resources out there about how to be a good ally to Indigenous people. If anyone wants some of that, maybe we could put some of this online at some point, Alex. Um, but I'm just really grateful to have the space to share about my work and my passions and um, hope to keep learning from all of you in the Pari community um, continuously. So. Chimi Gwich, that's a big heartfelt thank you and gratitude. This is really beautiful. Thank you both so much. And thank you, Melissa, for sharing your perspectives and your inspirations as well. I do have a few announcements before we leave. <clears throat> this is the 11th installation of the Future of Human series. <clears throat> and we have our 12th and final session in the Future of Human series next month, Wednesday, December 20th. Alex will be engaged in conversation with Michael Murphy, the founder of the Eastland Institute. So we thank you all so much for participating and we look forward to seeing you again soon. So with that, we're gonna do the famous uh, hand wave that Alex enjoys. So as you click out, if you could wave your hands, <laughs> um, you know, as a sign of friendship and everything, that would be amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank See you, you soon. Take care.